Hello, everyone. I'm Danny Holbrook alongside Miles Holiday and Nate Garlock. Gentlemen, another week has come and gone. High school football is just about finished. Can you believe it's episode number nine already? I know, right? Yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's going fast. Playoffs coming right around the corner. Everybody taking a look at those now. Conference championships going to get settled here over the next couple of weeks. A lot going on. It's exciting. All right, gentlemen, let's start it off here. The Di- Diamond Dave Bowen, best things we saw all week. Miles, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, number one, I have three things, okay? And you always all, have more than one. There are always, yeah. always uh, many things to be happy about and the best things I saw. These all came from uh, Friday night. I had the Wapakoneta team yes. against uh, Elida, fantastic football team. Caden Page, uh, the number one receiving option for Wapakoneta, number 11. Guys, I don't know if I've seen a high school receiver that can catch a hitch and then get vertical with the ball in his hands quicker than him. You get a chance to watch him. He has something special with that. Of course, Caleb Moyer, the quarterback. He's fantastic. Uh, surprise. He's yeah. really good, He's right? Fantastic. Now, here's the thing that I was so impressed with, though. The ball placement. A, a receiver's running across the field. He'll put it on the right side number, right? Every time he throws a football, it's in a very catchable spot. There is never a ball that is high that can get tipped or or deflected or a receiver has to reach behind him. He is accurate beyond accurate. He throws such a catchable football. And then Chris Martin, number 57, he is an offensive lineman for them. We've seen offensive linemen pull, and sometimes you get guys that will pull, and they'll just run out there and they'll look around and like, hey, I pulled, right? No, <laughs> right. <laughs> Not Chris Martin. This guy, when he pulls, he will go out there and he will get on people. He was outstanding pulling and getting on people and, and getting a block. He was one of the best performances I've ever seen by an offensive lineman in that respect early in the football game. But unfortunately, he, he rolled his ankle, wasn't able to finish the game. I think he's going to be okay moving forward, but he was outstanding. That Wapakoneta team, we knew they were good. That's my first time seeing him in real life. Deep, deep playoff yeah, run for yeah, those guys. I've got, him, yeah. got Gilly and I have him Friday night. That's gonna be a that's gonna be a treat. Yeah. Well, I mean, you talk about that game on Friday night. My best thing from this last week was actually Walpock's upcoming um, uh, matchup, the team that they're gonna be playing on this Friday, and it's that Bath Wildcat, but it's their defense. The defense from from Bath has been much aligned m- maligned yeah. all season long. You know, the, we know the offense can score. They've been in some great shootouts, but that defense has really struggled week in and week out, one of um, towards the bottom of the WBL when it comes to points given up and, and yardage and things like that. They needed a big game, and they got it this last weekend. I mean, they shut out a Defiance team that had been playing really, really good. That was probably the surprise of, of the week coming out of this area. Not that they won. I mean, I don't think people were – if you said, oh, hey, Bath beat Defiance, like, oh, but it wouldn't be the biggest shock in the world. But the fact that they won and they shut Defiance out, they held them oh, just huge. 166 yeah. yards. Crazy. If that offense and defense are now clicking, that's a really dangerous Bath team. Uh, don't forget, what, three weeks before that, they gave up 56 points right. to Elida? Yeah. Yeah. And then the throw is shut out against a Defiance team that had Anthony Wilder averaging 10 yards yeah. per carry? Absolutely. It was one of those scores when I looked at it on Friday after our game. I was like, that's got to be incorrect, right? Well, I thought, I figured somebody got hurt. I've, there's yeah. an injury, something just killed that momentum. It was a beautiful night. Mm-hmm. There was no weather issues whatsoever. Everybody was healthy. That bat defense just finally came to play, and they shut them down, and that, that was extremely impressive. Yeah, guys, for me, uh, Gilly and I went down to Minster Friday night. We had Minster Versailles. Fellas, there are three quarterbacks I've watched over the last two years that just really, really impressed me. Number one. No- Wait, hold on. Can we guess? <laughs> yes. Can we, can we play Try a game? It. Go ahead. What do you think? I'll um, give you initials. T. Oh, I know this one. Yeah, oh, I know yeah. this one. Oh, yeah. Davey Tavey and St. Clair. Clair. Oh, I knew it. You just had to give me another minute. I'd have so, gotten there. So, I remember yeah. he's brought you, him you've up You've mentioned him, yeah. I think, at least once yeah. we've talked uh, about an him. An hour yeah. on the <laughs> show, yeah. Tavey and St. Clair from Belfound, obviously a Division One recruit. Ryan Montgomery from Finley High School, obviously a Division One recruit. And, gentlemen, I got to see – Rogan Steffi play for Minster. Now, look, I'm not calling it. I'm not going to say it's going to be an upset, but he gives Minster an absolute chance to beat Marion Local Friday night. He is he is as dynamic a quarterback. He's got over 1,000 yards. He's thrown for 
ridiculous amount. But he's so athletic, guys. He has command of that offense. He is the real deal. He can play college football, and you ought to see him play basketball, fellas. He dropped 26 on Marion Local as a freshman. I was there that night. He is the real deal, guys. I think, I and I, and I said this about the Versailles game. I was wrong. Versailles kind of down this year for max standards. Don't get me wrong. Minster's got a shot at them Friday night. I really believe that. Yeah, I mean, I, we, we're going to cover that game later, so I'm going to save some of the stuff for, yeah. for the, when we get into it. But I, I, you, you have hit it right on the head. I mean, that is, I, I, I'm really excited about that. So am I. Yeah. <laughs> you guys know that that uh, app cameo, right? Yeah. Where, where you know stars can come on and talk yeah, to yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Everybody should have Danny for your birthday or something because when you talk to Danny after he sees an athlete for the first time like because I talked to you Friday after the game it is Miles you should see this guy I, oh my gosh no. he's unbelievable I, I, that's funny I, I've been like that since I was a little kid I, I get so enamored he when I see so a performance I, I do and I know that's the junkie in me the sports yeah. junkie <laughs> I, I, I thought you were going to say we should all go out and buy find a CC of Tavion St. Clair on cameo <laughs> and too. buy Danny a, a little greeting from I've Tavion got, he, he does my uh, uh, my voicemail with phone Tavian does. <laughs> so if you want Danny on Cameo, reach out. We are joined now. Miles, you want to do some introductions here? You get the best guests every week. Well, you can't go wrong with these two guys, right. can you? Right? Right. What, arguably one of the best players and one of the best coaches in Northwest Ohio, Andy Schaefer, the head football coach at uh, Columbus Grove, and everybody knows one of the best offensive players in all of Northwest Ohio, Trent Barraza. Guys, thanks so much for coming down and joining us. Yeah, appreciate it. Coach, let's get started. You're having a fantastic year. Uh, everything's falling into place. Talk to us about your coaching style a little bit. I mean, are you that guy, and, and we'll ask Trent the same question, are you that hard-nosed guy that's on them nonstop? Are you a player's coach, as they like to say? <laughs> What's your coaching style, Coach? Uh, I'm definitely, uh, I, I guess, on them. I'm always thinking two to three weeks ahead of time. I'm always really holding the coaches accountable, ho- holding the players accountable, and um, I, I guess, honestly, I'm never really satisfied, and, and and that's probably been a little bit more this year than any year, any year than the past. In fact, you know, some of my post game uh, comments to the team has been pretty rough, um, and, and and we're undefeated. So, um, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen if we lose? <laughs> but I just, uh, I think we got a special group and a special group of kids. Um, um, they certainly bought in. They have high expectations, and and when the bar is set as high as what we have it this year, um, you, you just always have to be improving yourself. Coach, you've you're, you're on your third quarterback now. I mean, and it's unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable the way you guys just don't miss a beat and and nothing phases you guys I've watched you guys several times this year, and I'm so impressed by you just go uh, You know we had the game at Allen East and the whole game plan was to stop you and you had it on 300 yards I mean, what's it like to coach kids that just nothing bothers them? Well, I, I think it did um, but it was very very short uh, lived um, you know, and I saw the, the, the look on the face in Patrick Henry game uh, when when Landon went down and it was just a couple plays before halftime and you know I was busy on the sidelines before I got into halftime and I walked into the locker room and it was complete silence and, and everybody just had stunned faces I went into the coach's office and saw the same look on the on the, on the coaches and, and then uh, I went off and I, I basically <laughs> you know we got this big board in our uh, locker room that it kind of talks about the all-state guys from Grove and there's a ton of them um, and I said those guys have all graduated and and the program kept going. You know, it's um, I can't ask people from last year's team to keep playing, and, and we've got to understand that at Columbus Grove, we build our culture to the point if it's unfortunate when we lose somebody, but when we do, we're bigger than one person. I mean, even I'd hate to say it, but even Trent Barraza, we're bigger than one person. We're bigger than Andy Schaefer as a coach. Um, we build our culture that way, and so instantly I could I could tell that the, it 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 clicked. And so yeah, there was a moment where. I guess we flinched, but um, you know it was next man up, and and the, the kids just rallied right around Riley Sauter when when he came in the next couple of weeks, and he did, did a phenomenal job. And and honestly, as soon as he went down, you know it was okay. Who's next? And we just kept going with with Hopkins. So um, you know I think it's it's really a credit to the kids that have bought into that type of mentality that it's whoever's whoever's next. What what so. So be it. Uh, we still got to play the game. We're Columbus Grove, and we'll be fine. Hey, Trent, 100 years of football at Columbus Grove. Obviously, this is a community that loves football. What age did you know, like, football is really important here, and I want to be a part of it? Um, eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade year, junior high, really. 
That is fantastic. And, and the community rallies around the football team, uh, kind of goes by, the community goes by how you guys do. Walk me through that week of anticipation, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. What's it like being around town as the game gets closer? Um, I mean, you'll start seeing, you'll hear people talk about the game and like what we're going to, um, like mon on Monday, you know, the game's on Friday. On Monday, people will be talking to us about, you know, like, what are you going to do for this week? You know, what, what are you doing at practice today differently than the way you did last week? How are you preparing for this team? And yeah, stuff like that. It's interesting to hear Coach talk, especially when he's talking about, hey, no one's bigger than, you know, the team itself. Because the reality of it is, and we all can be really honest about it, there's a lot of places where a coach wouldn't have that mentality when they have a player uh, of your talent. Yeah. 29 uh, 100-yard games setting the all-time record. You have over 5,000 career yards. These are not numbers that come through every day, and especially at a place like Columbus Grove where there's been a rich tradition of football players. What does that do when that mentality is your coach is not going to let you get to a point where it's like, hey, I'm good. I'm going to be I'm settling. You know, I, I don't have to put the work in. It sounds like you're still getting pushed every single day because he knows that's what's going to make you the best player you can be. What does that do for you as a player to help kind of keep you humble a little bit and keep working? Uh, like you said, it keeps me humble. Um, you know, obviously, if I was like, um, you know, all about myself guy, I mean, my alignment probably wouldn't want to block for me. Um, <laughs> that's why, point, I, yeah. I mean, in interviews, sometimes I, well, actually, every time I always, you know, give credit to my line and I give credit to my teammates because, you know, I wouldn't be breaking these goals if it wasn't for my, my front five or my receivers getting the outside blocks. And then, coach, kind of for you, like, how does it, you know, when you have somebody that you can just be like, uh, I always, when we talk about, players who are kind of like in, in Trent's area. It's, it's like the old Ki uh, Will Ferrell movie from Kicking and Screaming, right? Just get it to the Italians, right? It's like, let, let's, just, <laughs> let's just get it to Trent. Just get the ball. How do you, how do you fight that, or especially from yourself or some of your coaches, just be like, listen, it, 300 yards, 200 yards, whatever, third quarterback, just feed him the ball. But you guys continue to develop an entire offense, not just a, a one-man crew. Yeah, and that's where, um, I guess, two years ago I stepped back from um, being the offensive coordinator. And so I, I did call plays with Trent. And, and now that I have a different perspective and just kind of overseeing as a head coach, that's one thing I'm constantly doing is, is making sure that we're giving other people the ball, taking away tendencies. Because I, I really feel like if we stay as balanced as we possibly can, uh, Trent will be even better. And um, he certainly bought into that. And, um, you know, that's been big. And, and clearly, if the, I mean, we're in a big situation, a game on the line. Everybody in the world knows we're we're going to give the ball to Trenton. Uh, but but we also try to instill that mentality with our offensive line that, hey, everybody knows that he's going to get the ball. you got to do your job. And so um, there's, a, there's a fine balance of, of, of that. We still want to have that mentality of it doesn't matter. You know it's coming. We're still going to, I guess, dominate you. And, um, but yet we also want to stay balanced. How tough was that to make that step? Because uh, all coaches, especially yeah. calling plays, right? We love to call plays. Nobody wants to be a defensive guy. We want to call plays and design stuff. Was that tough for you to step back from that? It was huge. Um, I knew that I needed to do that. Um, just life situation. I wanted to see my son play college football. We were adopting some kids. Um, you know, just life was going to be different. And I knew that I needed to step back, but it was very difficult. I remember the first time I met with Trey Roney, I said, you know, you're going to call every Everything, but when the game's on the line, I'm still going to call it. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then all of a sudden, I'm just sit back and I'm like, well, that's the dumbest thing. And he was okay with it. Sure. He goes, I completely understand. And, and, and I was like, that is the dumbest thing that anybody could ever say because uh, 100%, it shows that I have zero trust in him. And so I needed to step back and said, this, this is your show. Um, I'll suggest things, but... You know, for the first year, it was like every time I suggested things, I, I could see him flinch. It was like, but I was going to call. And I was like, you don't have to justify anything. Sure. Whatever you want to call, you call. I'm going to suggest stuff, but, um, you know, do what you feel is right. So it, it's been difficult, but I, I think uh, we've, we've got it down to a science now. Do you have to remind the, the, the your, you know, sometimes you get assistant coaches, like, I got this new play. It's really cool, right? Do you have to remind guys, like, look, we're a physical football team. So we, we, we <laughs> want to stay a physical football team. So we, let's stop drawing up these things that aren't physical. Yeah, the biggest thing that I've always kind of talked about in the offensive room, anyhow, is identity. Uh, we've got to find our identity, and uh, sometimes we get away from that, and we need to get back to it. So honestly, that's that's been um, my whole talk, you know, Sunday and Monday with with our offensive staff. Let's get back to our identity. So yeah, it's 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 big. Do you have like a clipboard that just says hand to number three, throw to number three, <laughs> give to number three? Yes. Yeah. A couple yeah, of guys from WSN have been playing defense all year. <laughs> yeah. When in doubt, Coach, do you uh, look? You guys 
and I've said this on the radio show, and look, I'm not trying to get you guys big heads, but I've called you guys the king of the conference the last couple of years, and everybody, we talk about it every week, Miles and I and Nate on Fridays when we do the football show, we talk about that showdown. Everybody wants to see Grove and Bluff and blah, blah, blah. Do you, do you fight complacency with the kids? Do you, do, you, do you find that you have to, you know, you guys are beating people pretty good. Do you, do you ever have to say, look, we, are, we still have to prove ourselves? I mean, I, these, are, these are questions I need answers. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, honestly, this is something that we and I don't know where this came from. Um, I I just started doing it this year, and uh, um, there was another coach um, that kind of pointed out, man, that was really good. And I was like, I didn't even think about it. It would just kind of happen. But I started setting up, uh, instead of game goals, I set, like, first half goals um, against a team that we thought that we were so, like, against, I mean, this last week, I mean, the goal was what? It was 42 points in the first half. So. So it was like, we have got to get to 42, whatever we got to do, call timeouts, you know, go as fast as we can, push the pace, defense. So it, everything was about 42 of the first half, and we got exactly 42 of the first half. So um, that's that's kind of been the mentality this year. It's, it's been different, and I think it's forced kids to not uh, – It's I don't know, you can ask Trent, but I think it's forced kids to play faster. It yeah. kind of teaches you to play against yourselves, right? Your own expectations as opposed to your opponent. Is that right, Trent? Yeah. Um talking about 42 at half, you know, um, like we got to, the offense has to rely on the defense and like vice versa. Yeah. It's just like, we got to all be together when it comes to that. Well, Danny and I saw you uh, when you're a you know, freshman and sophomore, mm-hmm. right? Much yeah. different runner now. Um, you have developed a power into your game. You're just quickness and, and speed at that time. You are a very physical runner now. My question to you is, uh, who are some of the running backs that uh, when you were younger that you'd like to emulate and you studied and said, well, I want to run like that guy? Ooh, it was somebody in the high school. I think it was Garrett Niemeyer because I watched him when I was uh, younger. Uh, he was a Grove running back. I watched, um, I watched him coach – versus Seneca East mm-hmm. at Tiffin. Um, what was it, State Semis? Was that State Semis game? No. I just yeah, remember it, it snowing. before that, but yeah, it was a uh, regional semis. But I just always remember Garrett Niemeyer being like a like a pretty good running back, and I would always like – he played with my uncle Trevor. He was a receiver, so I always like knew that kind of group. So I was like, I want to be like Garrett, yeah. I said your running style to me reminds me of Robert Smith, and I don't know if you know who Robert Smith was. He was a Buckeye in the early 90s. Long strides. Long strides yeah. and a bigger guy, and that's the style you have. You, you're very patient when you wait for the hole to open up. and Yeah, just, yeah don't just feel bad if you don't know who Robert Smith is. I, I do this every <laughs> week with Robert these Smith two. These guys are constantly Coach throwing knows who out Robert names. Smith was. Scarlett Gray, I just, have to, gray, baby. I just yeah. have to sit there and go, oh, yeah, I bet that was a Vikings, great player. I have no Ohio idea State. what you're talking about. It, this is my every week, man. Don't feel bad. I want to ask you this, Trevor, because I ask every high school school player we have on this show yeah. everyone yeah the one team you enjoy beating the most week 10 it's bluffed oh. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are you still with the, the young am. lady at bluffton okay. all right sure right. she knows what's up <laughs> <laughs> no contact for the next two weeks i'm telling you <laughs> yeah you know that's right you heard Dan- danny was talking or joking about the wsn guys thinking that you played on the other side of the ball well it's your brother What's it been like going through this season? He's having a great year. Um, he's sitting, I think, still tied for first in interceptions in the league. What's that like being able to share the field with him and you guys having success on both sides of the ball? Uh, it's awesome. I mean, he gets it done on defense. I get it done on offense. Um, but, I mean, as far as he goes, he's been a heck of a player this year. I mean, mm-hmm. he's been very coachable. Uh, I think all of our coaches have really – bought into him and he's doing a good job for us what's that like at home there's still got to be a little bit of that oh, oh you got still... those two intercession great oh you see the 300 yards yeah yeah, yeah. He's, <laughs> he's getting a little big head sometimes so i gotta i gotta make him remember like yeah. i'm still big bro, so. trent when i when i used to coach and we'd play a guy of your stature and i'd say to my guys do not say anything to him do, you know help him up get him back to the huddle be super nice to him because the moment you start talking trash or doing something dirty that guy the light switch turns on right how do guys approach you? Are, are they, they you get a lot of trash talk, or do they get a little dirty underneath a pile once in a while? How, how's, how do they attack uh, Trent Barraza? Well, I guess it just depends on like where I have connections. I, I've played sports for a while, and I guess I've developed some relationships with kids from other schools, so I'm pretty cool with most people. But here and there, there'll be that one kid that I have no idea who he is, and he'll you know do something that was cheap, or I'm like, okay, you remember <laughs> him, don't you? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Coach. 
I'm fascinated to know this culture you've built over there is is is, is incredible. What did, what did you when you first came in? What did you have to do to establish that culture? I mean, what's the, I always ask coaches what's the one thing, and they always look at me like oh, there's a lot of things we do. But like, if you had to say we're going to change the culture here, because that's that that's the that's the key, I think, in my mind, to getting a program to where you want it to go. That foundation. Yeah, it's the, it's the culture. Can you, can you answer that? Or maybe uh, I ask you too much. I, I don't no, know. no, you can ask. Uh, it, it's a really a long, long type thing. I've gotten some clinic talks on it. But uh, uh, to me, number one, it, 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 it didn't happen right away. So you said, what did you do when you first got there? It, uh, screwed up. Maybe <laughs> times, honestly. And, uh, yeah, we were we were six and four one year, and, and oh, we, got, no. we got on, we got on a hot streak and made it to the state semifinals, and and that's that was the year that I, I think some things clicked. It was like because because as a team we really got together and we grew, and I started noticing this leadership thing. So um, I established like a leadership academy one year, and we started doing that and really kind of poured into some kids. Um, just outside of football, and then uh, and then uh, I was on a trip, and I kind of learned some like things about I was reading about like core values and that kind of stuff, and I honestly didn't really like that stuff at first, and um, all of a sudden something just kind of hit me that we needed to establish the core values, and it didn't matter year to year, record to record, it doesn't matter, it's going to be the same, we're not going to change it, and so I developed these five core values and tried to really instill that into our program. We vote on captains based on it. We we talk about one core value each week. Um, we got signs hanging in our locker room. Um, you know, we really spend a lot of time. When we get into the playoffs, we really kind of talk about it, um, get in small groups. And, you know, I think that has really changed. But but not only um, when you do that, you have to have coaches that buy in. You've got to have players that buy in. You can you can say that stuff all you want, but if nobody buys in, it's not going to work. But literally, I think everybody's bought in. They understand the importance of it. And, and then I'd also like to say just longevity of the staff. I, I've got the same staff that I've had for the last um, – shoot seven or eight years now and um, that makes a huge difference um, and that's hard at a small school but the guys that we have most of them are Grove graduates and, and they love the program and they bought into the like I said those core values and I think that's really changed our program. Trent do you, do you find that you take some of those core values uh, into your regular your everyday life uh, in the school maybe maybe in just your, your personal life as opposed to just being in football only with them? Yeah for sure. What are some of those values that uh, out of the five that coach brought up that really speak to you? Uh, attitude, just the way you carry yourself on and off the field. That's great. It's big. Neil, coach, you guys got – we got two weeks rest left in the regular season. You get a rivalry renewed this week against LCC. You get the big Week 10 showdown with Bluffton. Then here comes playoffs. Everybody – is already kind of forecasting that road for you guys already. You know, everybody wants to see that big matchup towards the end. How – difficult has it been for even just yourself to make sure that you guys are staying focused week to week and not listening to a lot of the other noise that's going on surrounding possible matchups what you guys are capable of doing and what may be waiting for you at the end I don't know I'll be honest with you I really don't think it's that difficult um, and I think it's mainly just because of the focus and in, in, in fire that we have in our practices we, we just don't have downtime we don't have time to think about other stuff and I know kids are hearing stuff outside I mean I know it and uh, I know coaches are hearing outside but as soon as three o'clock rolls along it's I mean it's LCC this week that's all we're talking about. Kids also understand, like you said, rivalry renewed. You know, Scott Pauldy, a Grove graduate. Um, you know, his name is is hanging up in our locker right, room on that right. same board that I talked about. I mean, he I was take it down this week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <he's> a, <laughs> Do you like they do in the kids? Knock it out. Yeah. 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 Sorry, sorry, coach. Yeah, yeah, but but seriously, I mean, the kids understand how important it is for this week. So I've really not. I've, I mean, I've never not really had a struggle with that this yeah. week or this year. How about with you, Trent? Has it kind of been the same thing, or are you guys finding it? You know, where sometimes you guys as leaders got to tell the other kids, hey. Focus. We got LCC. We still got regular season. We're not. We don't even need to worry about playoffs yet. Let alone what could be at the end of it. Yeah, I think some of our guys do look ahead a lot, but I mean, um, we keep people. You know, we try to make it one week at a time, and you know, one game at a time, and keep winning. Yeah. Well, let's talk about LCC this week. Big challenge. Um, looks like they're finally a little bit healthier than they were earlier in the year. Um, when you guys look at them on film, without giving us a ton of game plan, right? Because this is going to be out before the game. What are some things that impress you about LCC? 
Who are you asking? You, both, <laughs> of you. both of you. I like how they clammed up. Yeah, though. Well, I guess they don't want to give anything out. They don't want to give anything out. They play football. Right. That's yeah. what we yeah. saw. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They throw and run. And, uh, <laughs> no, they're 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 clearly a, a well coached team, and uh, I think the thing that really um, impresses me about Scott. Uh, Paulie, what he does when he calls the offense is, is he tries to make you think. And when you think, you play slow. And so he's going to do some window dressing stuff with motions and different people and, and uh, you know, false key on the offensive line, stuff to just make you think. And that worries me because we're a pretty sound team and um, we played pretty sound football defensively. But, you know, when we think, we obviously will play slow. So that, that's the thing that worries me uh, the most about their um, – you know about their offense and then defense. It's it, they're running the same stuff we do. So I I like our defense. I think it makes us successful. So it's a good defense, and they're running it. So I think that uh, um, it's going to cause some challenges. Yeah, Trent. Anything you see that uh, maybe you're like I got to push a gap a little bit more or bounce it outside a little bit quicker, or anything like that? Um, I mean, no, not really. I think with my me and my front five just keep doing our thing. We're going to be good. Coach, we do a football preview show every Friday on 931 The Fan, and, and Mark Shine comes on, and he's like a computer. The only other guy, <laughs> the only other guy that is like that is Ned Stickshaw. <laughs> I, I swear to you, he, he sends us stuff. I, yeah. He's impressive. He really yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, Ned, Ned does a great job. And, uh, you know, I was very cautious when I first got to Grove. And, and I had, who the heck is this guy? You know, and, uh, and as I started to see what he did, I was like, holy cow, this is amazing. And then, and then you quiz him on what – you remember that play in 1938? That oh yeah, I remember that play. No, I don't. I don't know. You just start making up stuff. But he knows it. He he's uh, he's really good. And and um, you know we um, I think the Lama News did an article. We you know we we do put him on a headset, and I, he he does help us break down stuff. And um, he stays quiet till I ask him a question, but he's always able to give me an answer right away, and that's pretty cool. Fill in the blank, both of you. This season is only a success if we what? <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say because you're going to say the same thing I'd say. You're all in, right? Yeah. This season is only. <laughs> Man, geez, we're, we're gonna, we're, I stop coming. Oh, no, no, that's just great. This is great. This is a great podcast. I, I, I would say a state title. Right? Yeah, I, that's what I was going to say. That's what yeah. I was going to say. You don't want Danny playing, believe me. You, you don't, don't want, want him to coach as soon as he yeah. walks yeah. out here going, why'd you uh, say that? Yeah. He's looking for a quarterback. I can do that. <laughs> uh, you know, Trent, you got a lot going on right now, man. You know, it's your senior season. You're you're playing really well. You're setting a lot of records, a lot of attention coming your way. Your team is doing fantastic. But in between all this stuff, the recruiting trail has really started to heat up for you. Uh, you know, I've been seeing on social, you've been making game day visits and different yeah. things like that. How have you been able to balance all of these things? You know, all the recruitment stuff, still making sure that you're focusing on football and what you got going on this year. It's not always the easiest for kids. How have you been able to do that? Uh, it's not always the easiest, and it's actually putting a lot of pressure on me right now, but uh, I think I'll be able to handle it. And um, um, going on these visits and stuff is pretty fun. I mean, learning, like, last week I seen a, D1, a D1 football game for the first time. It was pretty, oh, that's awesome. it was pretty that's good, awesome. yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but I mean, as far as balancing it, um, it's not it's not too bad. I mean, I'm getting getting through it, and yeah, really. You've been getting a lot of calls, coach, having you know about co colleges coming, wanting to talk with Trent and take, make visits. It's gonna it's gonna end up picking up here in the next couple of weeks. That's when colleges really start doing. And you know, we kind of you know told Trent and. I mean, they're they're coaching their season too. So, you know, it's it's the way it is. It's it's. Uh, I, I I hated it when uh, when I went through this with my son a couple of years ago. So, um, it is very stressful. It's hard to keep focus. But you know, so far Trent's done done a nice job with it. Have you had a favorite visit yet? Uh, I don't want to be biased or anything, but it's where his his son plays at Indiana Wesleyan, probably. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. All right. Coach, you guys um, have one of the best atmospheres in all of high school yeah. football. The light show is amazing. Everybody gets excited, right? Is it a school that is always going to stay a grass field, though, or is it something down the line? Maybe you guys go turf. I just see you guys always being, like, muddy and grimy yeah, and dirty. No, I hope so. I honestly do. I, I really hope our game field stays grass. Now, I will say this. I've been 
uh, I would love uh, a practice field turf because we, obviously we spend a lot more time on the practice field than we do the game field. And you saw our practice field. It looks like we practice on concrete. And uh, maybe that's why we're tough. But, yeah. you know, um, but I, I love the feel of grass. I think our groundskeepers do an amazing job of keeping that grass as nice as they can. And um, it's pretty special. It's a definitely a special place to play. Well, what about you, Trent? Would you rather play on grass or when you guys get a chance to play on turf, you feel faster? Which one do you like? Turf definitely makes our guys faster in every way. But, you know, when you get tackled, you know, and you get up and there's yeah. a huge scrape on your arm, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't feel good afterward. Is it difficult picking the right shoe to wear on turf compared to grass? Uh, I, don't, I don't really think so. I wear okay. the same cleats on yeah. both. Do you, do you know what the record is for your four years? Is it is it is this senior class? I mean, they they haven't lost many games. Is that long, I don't know. Yeah, was, I, I didn't Ned have Ned the was here. He would have told <laughs> oh, yeah, me. Yeah, Ned would have told me who they got beat by. Yeah, I was Yeah, I mean, does that does that matter to you? That legacy that you're leaving behind. I mean, do you like it when the junior high kids are watching you on Friday nights and you know other smaller kids in the midget ranks and stuff like that. And, yeah, I do. I um, I just hope that the junior high kids like can just see how hard we work and how hard we push to have a good season, and you know, it, want that, want more than that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming in. We really appreciate it. So, Fantastic. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Best of luck to you guys, and let's let's just win a state title for Northwest. Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. And look, I'm not saying your season's going to be a failure if you don't, but you're going you're going to win. Yeah. You're going to win. I got confidence in you. You guys are awesome. We wish you nothing but success. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank guys. you. Back here with the three wise men on WSN podcast, guys. What a great visit with head coach Andy Schaefer and Trent Barraza. Man, what a just a great program they're running over there, fellas. And uh, coach has got it going on. The culture, the wins, the, the very few losses. It's just a terrific program. Uh, he's got it rolling, like you said. And um, when the community uh, is embroiled and and wants to do well and, and supports it, it, it's amazing what you can accomplish, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I mean, there's, it's one of the things that we get spoiled with here in Northwest Ohio because there is nothing like small-town football in this area. The, the communities that we talk about consistently, and Columbus Grove is one of them, there's a reason that they win at the clip that they do. Everybody is all in. Everybody's bought in. You can see it on Friday nights. You heard Trent talking about it. Seventh and eighth grade, I was watching the high school. Those guys who, were, who I wanted to model my game after, they set the example. The coaches push these guys. The parents are highly involved. It, it, there's nothing better. And there's a reason that Columbus Grove consistently over at least my entire lifetime ha, has been so good. And so. it's one of those places you go on a Friday night, their practice field, there's like 30 little kids playing a yeah. football yeah. game. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I just like the way Coach owned every question we ask him. You know, a lot of times we'll ask questions and we get a lot of coach speak. He was direct with everything, you know. Yeah, very this honest. is how I am. This is what we do. And this is, yeah, so I like that. All right, gentlemen, it is time to preview the week eight schedule for WOSN. Guys, we're going to start off with those Columbus Grove Bulldogs. Lima Central Catholic comes calling. Lima Central Catholic comes in at six and two, four and one on the Northwest Conference. Columbus Grove, eight and oh, five and oh, still the king of the conference. Randy Roberts and our own Miles Holiday on the call. Oh, this is going to be a fun one, isn't it? Because yeah. LCC uh, looks like they're starting to get 100% healthy again. Uh, Matt Matthew Quatman played last week. Now, uh, they struggled a little bit against uh, Spencerville, but uh, they still got the victory, right? Um, so many great matchups in, in this one, right? You got Brady Parker, who's running the football better than he was early in the year at quarterback, throwing the ball really well. But then you got, as, as Nate said earlier, uh, Barraza, Gavin Barraza with four interceptions and Trevin Baxter with four interceptions. So it is a really good defensive secondary for Grove going against a really good deep ball passer in uh, Brady Parker throwing to Mylon Cowan. So that is a fun matchup. You also got the matchup on the line of scrimmage. You got the big guys up front with the the McKee brothers going against a really good defensive lineman for Grove. And then you got a great matchup of Caden Falky at linebacker going against Trent Barraza. I mean, it's a really fun uh, matchup game. game. Yeah. It, it should be. Um, however, when you look at LCC, and they might be a little shorthanded with experience. They started five sophomore and two freshmen last week. I think you got to look at Grove having an advantage because they're a veteran group. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, look, everything that you said is right on, and this looks like this should be a great one. You know, um, LCC has some pretty good players back in their secondary as well. Michael Quatman is actually tied yeah. with Barraza for good. interceptions. Yeah. He's doing a fantastic job. <clears throat> you know, but Kyle Hopkins is starting to come on. He yes. went 10 of 11 exactly. for 270 yards this last weekend. He had three touchdowns. He, if – 
Columbus Grove's offense all of a sudden isn't going to be predicated on Barraza having to do everything, then they're back to where they were in week two when we were saying almost the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. If Barraza doesn't have to do it all, how do you stop this team? Now, there's a lot of backstory in all this, and you heard Coach Schaefer talking about it, right? This is a Columbus Grove and LCC team that were fierce rivals in the NWC for many years. A lot of conference titles were settled in this game. Coach Palti has a very long history with Columbus Grove. These games always mean more to, to him, to the Columbus Grove community, to the LCC community. It, it's one of those ones where a lot of times, because of all the things surrounding it, records don't matter, stats don't matter. You, you, this one just has a different feel. It's like that Ohio State-Michigan matchup. It's like a lot of these high school matchups in the area where that's your rival. Now, you heard Trent say, hey, maybe they moved on from LCC a little bit, right? It's mm -hmm. Bluffton now with them because yeah, exactly. LCC's been out of that conference. <laughs> so is that the edge that LCC needs? Is that you know Grove doesn't quite still have that same fire for that LCC rivalry as maybe LCC does for Grove. Yeah, uh, Danny, real quick. Yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Right. LCC they beat Grove this Friday, right? And they went out, and then Grove beats Bluffton. It's a three -way, three, -way three way tie, tie yeah, right? So tie. this is going to be the best swing coming at uh, a Grove by LCC possible. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I look at this matchup, guys. I really like the LCC defensive line. I, I think they're really aggressive. Here's where I think the problem lies, as you said it earlier, the, the depth and inexperience of LCC right now, this time of year. Now, you know, earlier in the year, they didn't have the injuries and things like that. I just think that when you have the inexperience that LCC has and then and you look at Grove with the numbers they have and the depth, and the bottom line is the best player on the field is Trenton Barraza. Yeah. And I think when you have those, I think the advantage goes to Columbus Grove. Now, here's the other thing. If Parker gets in a groove and he starts throwing the ball like he's capable of, they can score with anybody. So you're right. I, you know, I, I'm not saying who's going to win this game. I, I have, if I had my pick, I would, but it's going to be a great win. I, really I, think, so. I think LCC, because we know Grove loves to run too high, right? Yeah, They're yeah. going to be in cover two, so that means only seven in the box. So LCC is going to have to run the football. If they can't run the football against seven in the box, yeah. then it's going to be a real rough night for them. Yeah. All right, guys, game two, Bath Wildcats at Wapakoneta. Myself and Darren Gil to be on the call. Bath rolls in six and three overall, six and two in the WBL. Wapakoneta just steamrolling along, eight and zero oh overall, seven and zero oh in the league. They are the king of the league, guys. That Bath offense is dynamite. The defense is playing better, brother. Hey, I'm not calling upset, but I'm telling you right now, this is going to be a fantastic game. Yeah, I mean, it definitely should be. This is going to be a matchup between the top two scoring offenses in the Western Buckeye League. Walpock and Bath are sitting one and two. The big difference here is that Walpock defense. They're only giving up 13 points a game it's coming really into good. this one. Right. They, yeah. they, they are able to throw big bodies at you. They, they're disruptive. They're fast. They fly to the football. And, you know, we've seen Bath struggle with that a little bit, but then we've also seen them be able to beat it with their quick passes. And... If Walpaw can contain Zach Welsh and what he can do when he has to take off and run, it's going to be a rough night for Bath. Now, is Bath capable of knocking off Walpaw? I, I truly, I, I think that they are. They are built. They have the offense that I is able to do agree, that. Yeah. It's going to come down to that defense. And we talked about Caleb Moyer earlier today. Um, I, you know, last couple of weeks he's looked fantastic. We're only two weeks removed from him being twenty three of twenty five. Right, right. Uh, That's you ridiculous. Know, you, isn't you, it? You, yeah, you <laughs> talked about the ball that he throws. One of the most impressive things to me when I've seen him play is, and we've seen a lot of high school quarterbacks, guys, we have, and sometimes they make throws and you're like, wow, that is a, that's a big time throw. Every time I've seen him throw the ball, it has looked like a different level than anybody else that I have seen. He doesn't under throw guys. He hits guys in stride. It's always out in front of him. Yep. And I have, I, I can only think of one pass where he put it in danger. Other than that, he's put it only where they're going to get it. He stays out of trouble. He still hasn't thrown an interception all year long. If Bath isn't able to find a way to make Caleb Moyer make mistakes, yeah, I think Walpaw continues this run. Caleb Moyer, I'll say this, guys, is as good at reading defense as any quarterback we have in the area, and he can identify cover two. He can identify zones, where to put the ball. He is a field general, mm -hmm. and that's you know him and his dad. His dad's the head coach, obviously, yeah. but that kid is really smart. When you put a football brain in a football body, you got a player. Yeah, and, and you got to credit the offensive line because how many times you go back and watch film, right? right? 
I mean, his pocket is clean. And, is. and so he's basically playing seven on seven because there's nobody getting a pass rush on him. Um, Travis Moyer, his dad, congratulations, 100th win as a head football coach last week. And there's going to be many more because I'm telling you, man, it's like a college program. Oh, I was so impressed culture. with them. Yeah. Unbelievable. Absolute dudes everywhere. I mean, yeah. they go eight deep <laughs> on the defensive line. They rotate bodies. Everybody that comes in looks like a carbon copy of the guy in front of them. They know They're, where the weight room is, don't they? There are no guys on the sideline that you say, oh, that kid's never getting in. Everybody looks the part. Now, the one thing I will say for on Bath's favor, you know, last Saturday, Miles, you know, uh, I joined you on your show, and we had a chance to talk um, with, Jack Rader. with Jack Rader, the defensive lineman from Bath. And the mantra that has gone through Bath for this whole season has been do your job. And it seems like last Friday night, that really clicked. And he was really big on, yeah, we just have to do our job. And it seems like everybody kind of has now bought into that. It knows what that is and is doing that. Yeah. If they come in with that same mentality against Walpock and everybody just does their job and they can slow down Moyer and they can slow down Jarrett Mullins and they, they can find a way to make sure that Page doesn't, Caden Page doesn't beat them over the top, you know, if you can slow down this wall park offense, they can score with the best of them, and this could be a lot tighter than people think. At a certain point, you know, we, we talked when we were talking to him, you know, we said, Hey, you guys kind of get overlooked. You guys, you know, people kind of look past you, and you know, when you guys win games, it's like, Oh, Bath won, that's a surprise. He goes, We're sick of it, we're sick of being overlooked. Mm. And you know, if you're sick of being overlooked, this is a week to make sure that that happens. Well, do your job. I guess early in the year it was just do your job on offense, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. They went and said, hey, guys, on defense, we should probably do that. Um, you got to believe, though, if Bath can pull an upset, and let's be honest, it would be an upset, right? For sure. They pulled the upset. Mikey Hale's going to have to have a monster game. He has to. Does he, though? Because, you know, they just won and beat Defiance 28 nothing, and he only had like 34 yards. Animal. They shut him down. It's a different animal. Well, I'm yeah, just saying, I, like, I now, so. but this Bath offense now – has shown that they can put points up and they can compete even with Mikey Hale not touching the football. Confidence is everything. If they get a score or two up on yep, confidence sure. is everything. Agreed, but it is a little beat up in the receiver position too, right? They, they're they missing yeah. some guys there, so they're going to have to run the football. Um, a really good offensive line at Bath, Isaiah Murphy, number 55, as good as anybody in the WBL. So if those guys show up and they limit uh, Wapak a little bit and, and can score with them in the first half, turn it into a slugfest in the second half, then they got a shot. But um, Andre Longsworth, I want to mention him. He is number 24 for Wapakoneta. He came in with uh, Bryson Pack. He left with a hand injury, and you thought, well, they're going to have trouble at running back. No, it was Marshawn Lynch carrying the football. <laughs> so uh, Andre Long Longsworth is just as good as anybody. He just hasn't got the carries yet. Game three, gentlemen, the Allen East Mustangs travel north to play the Bluffton Pirates. Garrett Mansfield and Dar Nevergall, Kenny Rogers, Burt Reynolds, whoever you want to call him. <laughs> He's the lookalike. <laughs> Guys, Allen East comes into this from three and four, two and three in the Northwest Conference. They made a change at quarterback. They moved Jackson Thompson back to the tailback position, and Bluffton comes in rolling along at eight and zero oh overall and five and zero. Oh. Everybody's awaiting that showdown against Columbus Grove. Any chance of a slip up this weekend? Uh, maybe so, because everybody thought last week it would be a huge uh, Bluffton win, right? But then all of a sudden Fort Laramie surprised everybody, scored 28 points. Right, right. And, I was and, surprised at that. And they yeah. throw the football, right? Fort Laramie? Well, Allen East, they can throw the football, football yep. right? You got three really good receivers and Deacon Jones. Best name in high school football right there, isn't yeah, it? Deacon, Deacon Jones. <laughs> yeah. 18 catches. Uh, you got Hunter Nichols at 15 catches and Ethan Young 13 catches. They got athletes, yeah. Yeah, and, and you made the, the comment about the quarterback change. Keegan yeah. Jones, 58% of his passes. They scored 33 points a game. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think they're going to give a game. Maybe they don't win it, but I think they can scare Bluffton a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. It, it was... You know that Bluffton defense has been incredible over you know for the past year and a half really yeah, in conference exactly. play they'd only been giving up outside of Columbus Grove they hadn't even given up a score other I think other than like maybe seven points to one team I can't quite remember at this point but Fort Lormy may have given up teams a blueprint right that there's that hey now you can throw on this team this is where the weakness is this is how you attack them now Alan East has gone through their own quarterback issues you know they're on a third quarterback for the season as well they have found ways to kind of keep things going they've struggled at times but they're coming off a big win off of, over a struggling Delphus Jefferson team maybe that gives them some confidence they're able to kind of get going and, and feeling a little bit better about themselves heading into this one you know and if, if 
nothing else, you know, if you're Alan East, you're in the spoiler role, right? Like, that's what you rally behind. Hey, listen, we, you know, we can knock a Bluffton off. Nobody expects us to do anything this week. We have nothing to lose. Let's go out here, show them, you know, that we can play with them. And, you know, maybe they also help out some other teams and show a couple of more weaknesses for the Pirates. Guys, I, I look at this a little different. I, look, Bluffton is gauging their program against one program and one program only, and that's <laughs> sure. Columbus Grove. And guys, right now, defensively, their statistics are better than Columbus Grove, if mm-hmm. you look at it. Yeah, they and were off- last year, though, yeah, too. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. And you look at their statistics offensively. Look, that's a really, really good team. Uh, I think Alan East is going to have trouble moving the ball against that defense. But I do I do like Alan East. I like the athletes they have. I like Jackson Thompson. I, I like Deacon mm-hmm. Jones. I like some of the kids they bring, bring out there. But I'll tell you, this Bluffton team is just <laughs> it's really good. Well, and here's the, my one thing about Bluffton. You know, coming into this season, I think there were some questions for teams, you know, about whether or not this Bluffton team was a rebuild or a reload. Because they lost a lot to graduation last year off for that really successful they team. Did. They came in and they seemed to be firing on all cylinders right away. But when you start looking at the schedule and you start looking at the teams that they mm-hmm. have played, it is not the most daunting of schedules. They got LCC without a Matthew without Matthew Quatman in a horrible rain yeah. with two very long delays because of power outages and all sorts of weird things. And that really is about their only real challenge that they had faced before they hit Fort Lormie. And then Fort Lormie is able to put on 28 points. points. I still think that there's some things to be cautious about about this Bluffton team as they move into week 9 and 10 and even into the postseason where they should feel like maybe we still have something to prove. Yeah, Bluffton is an explosive offense in their own right, especially with the, the sophomore quarterback that is outstanding. How many sophomore quarterbacks complete 66% of their passes Throw 16 TDs and only one interception. Yeah. They're dynamic. That's really good. Guys, game four, I think this is the game of the week. Minster <laughs> rolls into Marion local. Patrick Kamler, Jerry Snodgrass. Minster comes in at 7-1, and 5-1 and one in the MAC. Marion local, obviously, 8-0, no, 6-0 and oh in the league. They're the king. Gentlemen, I'm telling you, I think this is going to be an incredible game. You told me Friday had, this is going to be a win this, for Minster. I, I, I'm calling it. I'm calling oh! it. I'm calling the there upset. Look, because if there's anybody on Broken the schedule, stuffy. it's got to be. Look, it's got to be Minster or Goldwater, right? You're right. Oh, so, <laughs> so, so if I get the if I get the upset, who is going to be like, oh wow, Danny called the upset? Uh, well, yeah. listen. Prior to the season, I I actually picked Minster to win the MAC. I, I thought that this was a team who was looking for some redemption. You know, they they lost Brogan Stuffy before last season. You know, he was going to come in lighting his hair on fire. Yeah. yeah and I, so I, I really thought that this was a Minster team that could compete. Now. Three point loss to Coldwater. They were right there with them. This team is really good on offense and defense. They are number one team in rushing. Okay, they are number two in passing. Marion Local right there with them though. Brogan Steffi, the true definition of a dual threat quarterback. He can do it all. They have a great defense. They have all of the elements. However. They're playing Marion local, fellas. <laughs> right. Like, and at a certain point, as we could, I mean, I mean, calling upset every week, but nobody has shown that they can even score double Nine digit plus. points Nine on plus. this on this Flyers team. Now, without a doubt, this week and next week are the hardest games on Marion local schedule. But they haven't shown any reason to think that they're going to be any different. Now, as much as I, you know, because I look like a genius since I called this, you know, two months ago, I just don't see it happening. And again, it's not a knock on Minster. I think they're a fantastic team. I think they'll make a nice run in the playoffs. The problem is... (laughs) <laughs> they will then have to see Mary Local again, potentially, right? Yeah. Like, you, it, it, there's just... It, Imagine just, this scenario, Nate. If they beat Mary Local Friday night, then they have to play him again in the playoffs. Yeah, play you have out. to figure out a way to beat them <laughs> twice in a season? Good Lord. So, I, you know, this is also for the state tying uh, record, uh, to 57. tie the state record at 57 straight wins if Mary and Local wins. As much as Coach Goodwin downplays everything, and I'm sure he is not worried about this record, there's got to be a part of him that's like Delphi St. John's is a yeah. MAC team. They had a nice rivalry for a lot of years. I want it. I, I yeah. you know, the players have to be, you know, it's nice when you're married local and you're, you're kind of isolated out there, kind of in the middle of Maria Stein, out, you, out your own little world. But I don't know, man. I, as much as it would be just one of those things you open and you see the scoring, like what, and you'd have to see the game to see how it happened. I just, I don't see Marion Local losing. All right, so let's go through some of the numbers here. The, the 56 in a row, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 46 straight regular season wins, 24 straight at home, 
217 and 24 since 2008. That's pretty that's absurd. Nine state finals in 10 years, seven state titles in 10 years, outscoring opponents this year 407 to 22, <laughs> scoring 51 a game, only giving up three a game, have pitched five shutouts. And then you go over to the numbers for Minster, Rogan Steffi. <laughs> I, look, I, I I think he's dynamic enough to pull this. Off. I, I really do. Can he score forty points on his own? I don't know that he. I know this. Those those Minster kids are really really physical. I watched yeah. them last week. They're gonna have and to. I don't think there's any fear in those kids. That's that's what I'm saying. I, I think these kids know the Marion local kids. Look, Marion local is the king. We get that. That streak's gonna end sometime. And you need a dynamic playmaker to make that happen. This is the perfect scenario for me Mm -hmm. to see this kid. They can run the ball. They throw the ball. And he's at his best when he gets flushed out of the pocket. Mm -hmm. Marion Local has great athletes. Brogan Steffi's the best athlete in the MAC. uh, He he is. And average 36 points a game, uh, 416 yards per, per game. And how many of those are because of Brogan Steffi? You guys buying me pizza if I get this right? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, I mean, look, here's the thing. You know, they do have a good receiver, Dylan Heitkamp. He's third in in the league in receiving is about 500 yards for the season. The defense is really good. It's only giving up 16 points a game. These are all fantastic numbers. They are. Again, until you play Mary Local, who has the number one receiver in the match. They only give up three points a game. they're wizards. You know, I I can't remember the exact quote, and you guys, because you're old, you may remember the the quote, and you guys guys, guys might remember exactly the movie. I can't quite remember it, but I know there's a sports movie there somewhere, the quote that people talk about, and it says, do you you know, maybe maybe it's, do you know why the Cowboys always win? Or maybe it's because, why is Notre Dame always win or something? It says, because the other team's too busy looking at the helmets. Mm-hmm. And it feels a lot like that for this Marion local team because you can be as ready as you you can be all week long, having great practices, you're physical, you're, everything is great. And then you're standing on the field and out come the yellow helmets <laughs> and it's like, it's oh yeah, when the jerseys go on. that's them. When the jerseys go on. And you know, right now that's the air that Marion local is breathing. Mm. They saved the entire state if they pull the upset. <laughs> so remember, remember when? Uh, oh you know, yeah, you know yeah. what? Let's let you know. You think anybody's going? Hey, let's really make Mary no. local mad? No, right. Like, remember, let's upset them. Remember let's when get... Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson? The rest of the heavyweights went. Oh my gosh, it's possible. It's possible. Wow. Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> Game five, another Max showdown. Coldwater strolls into Versailles. Mark Shine, Dave Bowen on the call. Coldwater goes in undefeated, steamrolling towards that matchup with Marion Local. They go to Versailles. Versailles five and three, three and three. They've lost three in a row, fellas. Really uh, not what we were expecting out of Versailles. It's a good team, don't get me wrong. But boy, that 48 nothing loss to Marion Local, and then they get really hammered by uh, Minster. They lose that uh, close game to Anna, which nobody expected. They're reeling right now, and then they've got to get up after a three-game losing streak. Oh, by the way, here comes Coldwater. Yeah, Nate, we hit on it last week, right? They, they just can't score enough points, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's I – I don't know if there's any team that's reeling more than the Versailles Tigers right now. This was a team coming off of a state runner-up um, – um, last year as, as they finished their season a lot of high expectations they start this year five and zero. Oh, things are looking great state ranked but that you could kind of see there were some flaws even in that five and zero oh record and there were some games that you were like oh that one's a little mm-hmm. close and yeah. uh, and a lot of that stuff and then the last three weeks I feel like they've really been exposed it doesn't get any easier as it never does in the Mac as they now have to go up and play cold water and you know that cold water and coach Otten, they also know what's coming up in week 10 for them Absolutely. as well and they're going to make sure that they're fine on all cylinders coming out of this one so they can get ready for that big matchup now the one thing that Versailles does have in their favor right their d5 school once they they don't have to see any of these guys again. <laughs> they don't have to play them again. They don't have to play them again. And, and quite, and quite frankly, there, there's uh, there's a bye bye. Yeah. And you know, so they can still very much make a run. Yeah, they play an extremely <laughs> difficult league schedule. Let's get out of this MAC. Let's take our five and four, five and five record, and, go win a state title. and, and, and then make another run to state. And we don't have to see any of these dudes again until next fall. How many teams get to the playoffs and go? Whew, now we can relax. <laughs> how many te- how many teams like New Bremen two years ago finished third? 
third in the league and win the state title. Right, right. right. <laughs> Guys, uh, Friday night, uh, one team we have talked about on this show several times, the Lima Senior Spartans win their game 79 to nothing. Guys, running up the score, what, what do you consider to be running up the score, and when is it okay to run the score? Now, I would just want to say this. I, I saw that score Friday night on the way home, and I thought, man, alive, what are they running the score up for? I didn't realize they scored 72 points at the half, yeah. and they only scored a touchdown in the second half. It really changed my perception on everything. Look, I'm going to let my dogs hunt. In the first half, I really am. I find no fault in that. You know, if it was 140 at the end of the, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't think you can run up the score in the first. No, half, you right? can, you, right? You can. You, you got to play regular football nope, in the first half. Sure. Second half, and I've always gone by this adage, right? If the other team is running off tackle, they're doing the right thing, handing the football off, and you're not stopping them in the second half, 100%. that that is not yeah, running your, that, up the yeah, score. That is your, your fault. fault. But if they are throwing the football over top of your head and putting points on the board when the game is way out of hand, running trick plays, running fake punts, those types of things in the second half, that's running up the score in my and, estimation. And, you know, that Lima Senior team, I, I was watching the highlights, right? They had a 98-yard pass play. Yeah. They had some screens that broke that went for 60 or 70 yards. I mean, that that's their offense. They were just running their offense. You know, Janias Hall set a new OHSAA record for touchdowns in a game. He threw 10 of them. 10 of them. In a half. Right. That's incredible. Um, you know, Boog Wilson set the school record for uh, receiving yards in a season, did it in just eight games. So there were some good things that came out of there. You know, but that's that's rough. It is what it is, though. You know, I don't think Lima Sr. did anything wrong. Um, I, I think I, I it, it does remind me to probably send a thank you note to the OHSAA and for running clock, doing a running clock, clock yeah. because I can't imagine if that game had to play regular stoppage in the second half. Um, but, you know, at a certain point, you got to stop somebody. And, you know, Lima Senior, everybody knows what they're going to do. You have to be ready for it. And if you're not, I mean, that's kind of I on you as a, as a team. I mean, that's that competitiveness. I think it's more embarrassing. If you tell the kid to step out of bounds at the five or the two or the one, right, instead of scoring a touchdown? Well, then what are you yeah. supposed to do? Just take a knee yeah. for yeah. three and then I punt it? I mean, I, I it, at a certain point, you, you, you know, you're going to play. You're going to play your offense. You still have things to work for. I mean, their season's not over. Lima Senior knows that they're not going to be have a super high um, placing in, in – the playoffs, right? They're right now sitting at ninth. They're not even got a home game. Mm-hmm. Now they win their last two. They should bump up, but it may only be eight and seven, which means they have a competitive first round game and a difficult second game. They're trying to get themselves ready to go as well. They can't just take a week off because, you know, it, the scoring was easy. Now, Danny, you and I, we are, uh, as Nate likes to remind us, uh, we are older than Nate, right? And Well, let me move my walker out of the way so I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, that's a really cool rascal that you got. I, well, yeah, yeah, I chose mobility. <laughs> <laughs> I've fallen and I can't get up. But You guys are doing a great job of telling everybody that you're not old as right, you're telling these right. super old and jokes that only a certain <laughs> segment of our listeners are going to get. we're doing sports stuff. <laughs> Sorry, Kelsey. <laughs> but, but you and I are old enough to remember before the running clock. Yes. It, running up the score, that was something that was commonplace, wasn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. it was. Uh, guys, I was at a – I want to tell you a story. I was at a high school football game a couple years ago. I'm not going to tell you the schools, the two schools. I will off the air later. Uh, one of the schools was beating the other school pretty bad. And the school that was winning the game was back in punt. They, they were going back to catch a punt. And the kid fair caught the punt, and the – team that was getting smoked this kid just plowed into him okay and it was a bad score it was it was a bad score the two head coaches the head coach for the team that was winning walked out on the field to the mid stripe and he looked over at the sidelines and he told the other coach if you don't take that kid out of the ball game I'm gonna score 100 on you I was there I was there for the whole thing and the other coach did not take him out and they proceeded to just run it up and I don't know where I lie in that whole situation because sometimes you got to send a message. Yeah. And I don't I, look, I don't advocate anybody getting hurt. I don't. No. But man alive. So, it's, it's, I'm, I'm just reading. When is it okay to run up the score? Yeah. I don't know. Well, so I, so I get, I can remember when I was a kid, and I forget how old exactly I was, but, and it's the only score that really sticks with me. I'll forget everything that we've talked about here 
tonight, today. Who's old now? Tomorrow. Yeah. Well, you know, I just got other things to worry about. No, yeah. but I can remember, I mean, like it was yesterday, looking in the newspaper and seeing Columbus Grove beating Carey 99 to 3. And that was way before running clocks mm-hmm. or anything like that. And I remember that score forever and just thinking, Good Lord. And I, I, I'm like, can you imagine playing in a game where a team scored 99 on you? You only got three. That I don't know the circumstances of any of that. That's a crazy lopsided score, right? Yeah. I, I do remember one time, this was a long time ago though, and um there there was a team that was getting beat and they were getting they were getting outscored. It was they were getting beat by quite a bit. Um and a team actually ran a fake punt on them mm. and completely completely made the other the other coach furious. Some weather comes in. It was late in the game. He decides, you know, they're going to call it. They're going to bring it in. And then that coach is like, they they, were, they wanted to call it because of weather. Yeah. And that coach is like, no. And you want to know why? You're coming back kid. tomorrow morning. And you want to know why? Yeah. Because you decided to run a fake punt on me. Yeah. And he made them come back yeah. the next day to finish the last couple Good minutes of the game. Oh, rocket I mean, so, you know. <laughs> The stuff you know, there are know. consequences yeah. to running yeah. up Absolutely. scores and doing things yeah. like that. There are. Hey, look, Woody Hayes said it best. Why didn't you go for two? Because I couldn't go yeah, for three. Yeah, three. Uh, <laughs> they, Miles is right. That back in the day, uh, and usually, guys, those are personal situations between oh, head coaches. Absolutely. Those for are sure. Yeah, th- yeah the, the kids sure. have nothing to do with that, but they pay. The well, price. they all the kids are doing are running the play that the coach has called. Right, it's not like the right. kids decided to oh, do I'll it. I'll tell you this though. When you get a chance to run it up on a guy that did some wrong to you, sure. kids get fired I'm up. Excited. They want to. And that's I, when it's I've okay, there. in my yeah. opinion. If, if there's a school that did you wrong, did you dirty, it ran it up on you, and that's a, usually it's a coach that's gone by then, right? Because right. yeah. they, they've taken yeah. off. But if you get a chance to, to pay it back, I think you and can. And I think, that, honestly, right. I think that's in all sports because I can tell you in other sports that I've coached, I've been on both ends of it. Mm-hmm. And I've always tried to be like, hey, listen, you know, we're, we'll, we'll back it down. We're not going to embarrass people here today. That's not what we're here to do. But we've had people do it to us. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and then, you know, my guys get, and I'm like, listen, you know what it was like when it happened to you, so that's why we're not going to do it to them. But then people want to do it to us. Okay. But we're not going to forget. And we're not always going to be yeah, down. And right. then when the yeah. when the tables have turned, I, you better not be yelling from the other sideline. It doesn't yeah. just happen in football. It happens in high school basketball in this area, too. I've seen it you know, a lot. Coaches oh, yeah. In the third and fourth quarter still pressing when they're up Yeah, 35. back in the day when they do yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Guys, the Buckeyes go into Eugene, Oregon Saturday night and suffer their first loss of the year. Uh, can this Buckeye team bounce back from this and still contend for a, not only a Big Ten title, but a national title? Nate, what do you think, buddy? So I, I say, yeah, I mean, look, it, it – it, this all is very disheartening. Unfortunately, it's something that, um, you know, as you guys love to talk about my negativity, <laughs> I, I, I had been, I had we been, do. I had been concerned about this since week one. I talked like I've just had this feeling of impending doom since the first kickoff with all of the expectations that got thrown on this team and all best team money can buy and blah, 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 and all these things. And I, I haven't really been able to enjoy this season <laughs> at all because it's because just like us. at some point. <laughs> because of us. Well, it's just I just felt like the reality of it was is when you were watching things on the field, it wasn't always coming together on both sides like it needed to. I felt like there was just too many things that seemed unsettled. We weren't just dominating from start to finish in games. We would go through stretches of dominating but it wasn't from the opening kick to the end. And I, I, I was concerned. We talked about it. You know, you, I know, Miles, you really thought that this was going to be a two-score game. I did. And I was like, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Like, I'm not really sure why Ohio State fans are thinking that this Oregon team isn't going to be good. I thought this would be a close game. And then there were a ton of mistakes. There's clock management issues. There's 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 all sorts of things that you can talk Turnovers, about. Weird yeah, plays. Yeah, yeah, like there's a lot of weird stuff. So do not I think receivers. at the end of the yeah. day – they still lost to the number three team in the country by one, by one and off of won. some bad clock management. And can right? you tell us, the listeners, who the best player for Ohio State Saturday night was? Um, I oh, mean, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> say it, say W-H. it, Nate, W-H. say it, Nate. You can't deny it. Oh, he was oh. he was really good He's Saturday night. Um, and I said to you, you're going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I'll give you that. Yeah, uh, Mecca. I think Mecca played pretty good. <laughs> he did. He yeah, did. yeah. But so. you got to admit, Will Howard. Do I? Exception. I don't have to admit anything. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I ain't got to. I ain't got to admit. Ground, I ain't got to admit a thing. Cause you know what? 
who had the ball in his hands at the end of the game when it mattered most when we ran out of time? Well, Will that Howard. Was a, that was a call. Was it? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Or was it just a loss of where you were, time on the he clock was, at a certain point? He was Listen, unflappable. He was is, so that which, good. is that why he yes. slid with zero time left? Well, he didn't have a choice. Yes, yeah, sure he did. Because if you're going to run and there's zero time left, why are you sliding? Well, you have to know the clock at that point. He did. Because he, if it's not there and you're not going to clock it right away and get, just figure it out, tried to then, get down. then you... It, no, it was zero. Now stop it. He he could have done. He, he at that point so he was going to do something else. He just he gave it up because he was doing the right thing as far as I'm going to get down. Yeah. We're going to call that timeout. We'll get the field goal. He wasn't aware of the time. That's that internal clock. He that that is on him. Now I I blame Ryan Day for putting him in that position with some of the stuff that happened Should've earlier in that field drive field. for a hundred percent. But as the starting quarterback of the Ohio State Buckeyes. You have to have that internal clock in that moment, in that big game. We talked about it, yep. and I'm not saying that Will Howard lost them that game, but he didn't give them the chance to win it like he should have. He's going to win us a Big Ten title. I firmly believe that. There were just so many weird things, right? A ton I mean, of weird things. Denzel Burke. I mean, was a he pylon, looked awful. awful. He looked out there, awful. Right? That, but that was targeted guys. And, they, and, they they went after him intentionally. Oh, well, sure. and yeah. we talked about that though. Like we felt like he had to be one of the better players yeah, on the did. field, and he was he the was worst. For Oregon. Yeah. It was awful. <laughs> um, the the uh, ping pong kickoff, right? Yeah. Uh, um, the OPI, which drastically changed the game. The twelve guys on the field, uh, which was uh, officiated t- terribly. Uh, the clock mo- management. We get to the twenty eight with the timeout, and we don't run the ball to get in a better field goal position with the timeout there's just so many weird things in that football game no pass rush because they're grabbing cloth on every Mm -hmm. single play but yet like Nate said we only lost by one so it it does kind of make you step back and say well, hey, maybe we are pretty good. Oregon played about the best they could ever play, Oregon's and they good. just Oregon's barely, yeah. barely beat us by one. And Nate brought up a pretty good point. Well, maybe the guys relax now and just play football and instead of trying to point. live up to a, a unbelievable standard that can't be reached. Everybody had these amazing expectations. Now that maybe they can relax. Now, they will do that if they do one thing. Free Jack Sawyer and JTT. Yeah. Let them go to the quarterback. They don't. They don't. Let they them do don't. It. They make them rush C gap. Run. And it's up hurt their field, legacy. It's hurt field, their legacy. Run up field. Let them loose. Let them go get that. If they got to spin back inside of a tackle, they got to rip back inside. They, go ahead. The defense seems scared of a repeat of what of last year, where they just got Tim tore. And, yeah, and yeah. so now it's instead of that attack, attack, attack. It's well, we'll just play this. We'll keep everything in Very front of static. us. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and it's it. I mean, it's going to bite them. Here's no. what I'm afraid of, fellas. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid Darkness? of no. spiders, ghosts, both stinks. Oh, yes. Oh, hey, I'm afraid Absolute. of this. Heights. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> there are che- <laughs> if the Buckeyes stumble against Penn State and have two losses, then I'm thinking that committee is going to sit in that room at the end of the football season and look at that schedule at the beginning of the year and not put us in the 12th team field. They, there are two losses that would have been to number three and number four. On, both of them on the road, but or, still. No, it would be number three and number three, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, both of yeah. them on the road still. But I just, that schedule was just awful. I, now, I, Michigan worked it worked Well, the but, and, and, and you're year. right, but if you're talking about maybe a second loss to Penn State, that's assuming then that they be, beat a ranked Indiana team, a ranked Nebraska team, and a ranked Michigan team. That should cancel out. Sure. You know, the, uh, a really weak non-conference with, you know, multiple ranked wins on your schedule. I think two losses isn't a problem for them getting in. Um, that does, uh, makes no margin against Michigan, which... I, well, and what it does, I, though, is it care. makes your... It make, it, you don't get your bye, and it makes your first round very competitive. You don't get that kind of that, you well, know... had a great point today on the show. Yeah, think about this scenario, okay? Um, you, don't, you don't play in a Big Ten championship game, okay? So there's your bye week. Mm-hmm. You, you're the five seed, and you play at home. In the second week of December. Second week. Yeah, right. second Would you rather December. have that than playing in the Big Ten uh, championship game, maybe yeah. losing that? I mean, Bring someone from the SEC up the second I mean, week of December I mean, in Columbus. Maybe. Uh, you're not wrong, but it's also then it's like, all right, now all the stuff that people have talked about of really watering down college football has now happened because now we don't care if we win a Big Ten championship title. Oh, you're no, right I, about that. that yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. now, it's, now it's like, all right, now yeah, yeah. unfortunately the things that people said would happen – 
happen. I wonder if yeah. eventually we'll see. It's weird, if, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> if we'll eventually see conferences go away from championship games because of that. Well, I mean, yeah. the big reason and the big push to even do it to begin with was because you had to have it to get into the top four, right? And yeah. now that yeah. doesn't really seem to be something. Now, let me ask you this before we move on. Yeah. Who do you blame for the loss? Uh, right, you got to go um, Jim, Jim Knowles. Knowles. <laughs> you, you got to. 500 yeah. yards offense. You got the, to. the scheme just wasn't. Yeah. You guys don't blame Day? I don't Because he's blame taking him. a lot of heat right now. Rightfully so. You're the head football yeah, coach. You should. And, he should. He, and yeah. he, he's one in seven against ranked opponents. He do, he hasn't shown to be able to win a big game. But These are at, all the talking points that are going around absolutely. him right now. And, and they just, should be. And I'll just say this. That I'm a Ryan Day fan. I always have been, always will be. Um, but look at those losses, some of those losses, just the craziest plays. And, I, and I'm not making well, excuses. I know, but, uh, yeah, it, some, I know. I know. Uh, the other yeah. teams won them off yeah. of the crazy plays. I mean, sure. at a certain point. Yeah. You know, you don't put yourself in position to get beat by crazy Ask plays, me that. Right? Ask me that in six weeks if he loses to Michigan. All right, well, let me write it down yeah. so I remember. <laughs> All right, guys, let's wrap this one up. Our Power 5 football teams in Northwest Ohio. I got a feeling that all three of them are going to be the same. same. What are you talking about? I've got changing. a slash over here. I've got two on the outside looking in. Who, so Who are your two? My two on the outside yeah, looking in, yeah. Minster and Lima Senior. I'm giving them some love. All right, okay. I'm giving them some love. My top five. Can I go first? I never Absolutely. go Absolutely. Go ahead, Danny. I know this is going to come as a shock, but I'm going with a little school down in Mercer County called Marion Local. Oh, I know you've heard of them. No yeah, way. pretty good team. I like the Wapakoneta Redskins. I like the Columbus Grove Bulldogs. I like the Coldwater Cavaliers, and I like the Bluffton Pirates. Yep. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, um, um, yep. No, nothing's really changed. Yeah. Um, on my outside looking in, I have yeah. uh, I have the Shawnee soccer team. Um, <laughs> yeah. He had cold water volleyball last <laughs> week. Know, that's yeah, why yeah. I'm, they're dominant. Yeah. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. That's their player of the year. Um, I have Minster on the outside looking in as well. Um, Wapakoneta, man, I, I, I don't remember the last time I've been more impressed. Uh, on all three units like them. They were just I'm excited. Do so you know how much I wish that that week one game hadn't got changed and we got to see Walpock versus Marion Local week one again? Oh, I know, right? Oh, yeah. that would been fantastic. Yeah. Wouldn't it right? be better if it was a week 10 game? Uh, yeah, <laughs> for, but, you know, that's yeah. also how close Marion Local was to losing this, you know, uh, win streak that we we're talking about. You know, and they played Walpock in two years, and that one was a last second. La- I mean, it was as tight as well, a tight the, could in be. In the first sales game last year, they win by a point. Yeah. I mean, so. it's it's a thin margin. So. Not this year. Yeah. <laughs> and then we got Grove and Bluffton, of course, and then Marion Local and Coldwater. Now, let me ask you guys this question. Danny has Lima Sr. on the outside looking in. Which one of those five teams would Lima Sr. maybe knock off? Bluffton. 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 Yeah. And I, and I yeah. think because Bluffton – appears to be susceptible to the pass right. which is what lima senior week. does yeah. they're going to go to the air they're going to dominate you that they dominate you that way and if that's bluffton's weakness that's not and, a good matchup we, we talk so much about the league that lima seniors and it's not those kids fault they're doing exactly as they're told to do they're scoring touchdowns mm-hmm. they're playing defense they're winning games good for them and, and my argument has been all season and it will continue to be is that Yes, that the TCAL is a weak conference. There's not a lot of good teams in there right now. However, there's a lot of teams that are playing TCAL teams as well as Lima Senior, not and not one of them are putting up the scores and numbers that Lima Senior does against these teams. Yep. Janias Hall, 10 touchdowns in that game, right? Yep. Um, is it also the record for most uh, touchdowns thrown in the first half? It has to be. Right. It has, it has to be. Right. If, if, yeah. if it's in a game, it's in the half for sure. Because <laughs> yeah. so. they're all in that first half, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Gentlemen, thanks a lot. Let's do it again. Week 9 high school football next week. We'll be right back here and uh, more great guests and uh, more great topics. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. You've been listening to the Three Wise Men on the WSN Podcast. Good job, guys.